Welcome everyone to today's HLA webinar, Good Enough. Thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Watson and I am the meeting planner for HLA and your host today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for playback at a later time on the HLA website at hearingloss.org. I need to give you some technical tips to get started. To see captions on this webinar, you'll need to click on the CC icon and click on show subtitle. You can change the font size in subtitle settings. Chat is available for technical issues and panelists only. We would like participants to please use the Q&A icon to ask questions. We'll be using this to facilitate questions and answers after the presentation. If you've joined by computer, the presentation should be in side-by-side -side mode. Slides are on the left and panelists are on the right in gallery view. You can change the side that you can change the size of your side-by-side -side view by hovering between the two screens and moving the gray bar to adjust to your desired side size. If you have joined by mobile device, Hold on. Uh, if you have joined by mobile device or phone, your view may be different and you may have to scroll between views to the desired one. Oh. All right, Stu, I'm now giving you remote control of the PowerPoint. Our, pres our presenters today are Stu Nunnery and Lori Jonathan. Stu has studied piano, voice, acting, improvisation, and public speaking in New York, Philadelphia, and Providence, Rhode Island. He's a member of the Association of Adult Musicians with Hearing Loss and is a hearing loss advocate. Lori is a retired registered nurse from Yale New Haven's Neonatal Infant Care Unit. She sings in a woman's acapella group. She studies acting and piano as well. Stu and Lori collaborated in writing their screenplay, Good Enough. All right, Stu. Um, you should have control of the PowerPoint now and you can go ahead and start your presentation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Try. Uh oh. No. Try again. Okay. If it's not working, Stu, you can just tell me to advance the slide for you. Okay, that's fine. Oh, it did. It did. Hold on. Okay, I hope everybody's taking notes. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, I'm going forward. Hold on one second. Let me. And we're pretty much done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just share my screen again. All right, so just tell me when you want me to. Go Let's forward. go back to the beginning. Oh, you know what? Can you do that again? The it's very brief to share the screen. Okay, you there can go, we go. You can go to the first. That's fine. And if you're ready, I'll start. Go ahead. And I want to say good day to all, and thanks to Amanda and Carla and Cindy, and especially to Barbara Kelly, who was very kindly gave us this invitation to conduct this webinar today. I am very proud to be part of the HLAA community that I joined very late in life, and sorry I did. And I'm happy to be with you all wherever you are, reading, watching, or listening. Lori Jonasson and I, my sweetheart, will share our story today about a deaf musician who gives up everything for one last chance at making music again and falls in love with the woman of his dreams he didn't know he was looking for. I happen to be the deaf musician, and Lori is the woman of my dreams who is not deaf, but who endures life with me regardless. And for that, she makes my life so much richer. So I wanna talk about stories today, and we'll start with the first slide. Each of us with a hearing loss has a story, several of them, that goes beyond our hearing losses, our hearing aids, and the challenges we face living with them. If you think about your life with a hearing loss, how much of the time have you spoken about your hearing loss? 
And how much of the time in your life have you talked about other things as well? Slide. Next slide. Here you go. Hello. Okay. Every personal story about hearing loss is unique, just as our hearing losses are unique. Next slide. There's a prevailing opinion out there that we need more stories about hearing loss. Authentic stories written, narrated, acted, produced, and directed by the deaf and the hard of hearing. Slide. More stories about our everyday life, our triumphs, our failures, work, families, reaching and not reaching our dreams that include and go beyond our hearing loss. Slide. More narratives about real, three-dimensional characters living real, three-dimensional lives, not just people with a disability. And we can use every mode of artistic expression, art, music, dance, theater, film, recordings, books, poetry, and humor to tell our stories. So rhetorically, I ask you now, have you been telling your story? Do you write? Do you make music? Do you dance? Are you making films in some way to narrate your stories? Next slide. Here's what the landscape looks like. More stories about people with hearing loss are starting to appear on screen. Many of them with deaf characters portrayed by hearing actors. It's a big issue in Hollywood and in our community as well. Slide. More than 50 actors have been nominated for an Academy Award after portraying a disabled character. Slide. Marley Matlin for Children of a Lesser God in 1986 is still the only deaf actor to win or be nominated for an Academy Award. Slide. More deaf and hard of hearing actors are finding work on TV and in films and behind the scenes. Recently, I sat in on a panel of disabled actors, filmmakers, and others who discussed their experiences in Hollywood. Slide. They all agreed that as of today, there are three very common narratives about the disabled that wind up on screen or on the stage. The pity narrative. I have a disability, feel sorry for me. The miracles and cures narrative. I'm cured, something happened and we found the, the, the mystery of, of my hearing loss or my disability and I'm better for it. And then there's the deaf. We couldn't save the child, he or she was too disabled or the disability eventually created an early death. The three most common narratives about the disabled. Slide. But Hollywood has finally taken notice. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences recently established new standards for future best film Oscars, slide. Starting in 2022, films will not be eligible for the best picture Oscar unless they can demonstrate greater, greater accessibility and diversity, both on the screen and behind the scenes, slide. This means that being targeted are not only more women and minorities, which we hear a lot about when the Academy Awards show up, but also specifically, the disabled, the deaf, and the hard of hearing, on screen and behind the scenes. So not just actors and actresses appearing on stage, but all the people that work behind the scenes on films and plays need to be represented as well. Slide. Here's my story. In 1978, I was 29 years of age and suffered a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. My left ear was gone immediately. In 1980, the same thing happened to my right ear, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. This time I was put on steroids. I retained some residual hearing, told to get on with my life. But in 1983, both eyes were compromised and I lost the vision in my right eye. Slide. What would you do or did you do when you knew that you had suffered a hearing loss? What did the doctor tell you? What did you think you were going to do? Now, again, I lost my hearing in 1978. Things were not as up to date as they were today. Would you get fitted for a hearing aid, cochlear implant or an ocular device as I did and go back to work? Did you have other choices? Did you have no choice? Slot. I could not just get a hearing aid and an ocular device and go back to work. 
When I say an ocular device, I wear a scleral shell in my right eye. I have no vision there, but this is a contact lens that's painted to look like my other eye, and I wear it over the top of my eye. But even with that device and a hearing aid, I couldn't go back to work. I was a musician, a singer songwriter, a recording artist and a composer of radio and television jingles, even songs for Disney, slide. My livelihood depended entirely on the precision of my musical skills, especially my voice. I suffer from serious tinnitus and had pitch distortion. Listening, playing and singing music were physically painful, slide. By 1981, my music career was over for the next 40 years. Music had been the most joyful, satisfying and financially rewarding professional pursuit of my life and remains so to this day, slide. It's said that for many, the loss of music is often worse than the loss of speech understanding. And I can imagine a lot of heads nodding correct with that one. Confucius knew too. He said, music produces a kind of pleasure which human nature cannot do without. I certainly couldn't. I lost my identity. I had an international reputation. I had hit records in the United States and Brazil and fans around the world. I could no longer reach out to them with new lyrics and music. Slide. Who was I now? I was in fact humiliated and embarrassed. I was 29 years of age, working in a high, um, high end industry with very talented people who were making a lot of money. I was one of them. But losing my hearing at 29 was humiliating and embarrassing. And who knew about hearing loss in my profession? Nobody talked about it. And if you were experiencing any kind of hearing problems while you were working, you never discussed it. HLAA had just come into business and there were no resources out there for me to go to. Slide. So I disappeared and I would not reappear until I was fixed and back making music again, I thought. I didn't just want a hearing aid and a job. I wanted to make music again. Slide. I vowed to do whatever it took to get there because I didn't know enough about hearing loss to not hope or to fear that I couldn't make it back. Slide. My first steps were not to get a hearing aid, they were to heal myself through diet and nutrition. I had the notion back then that hearing loss was like any other serious illness and could be resolved or cured in some way. I chose the food and health route and became a food fanatic. I studied macrobiotics and esoteric dietary regimes I got into herbal medicine and supplements and elixirs. Slide. I studied natural gourmet cookery in New York, used medicinal recipes to cook for people with cancer. And I spent seven years on the road for a natural foods company selling their foods and their philosophy, both of which I subscribe to. The results, my dietary changes. Well, I feel that those changes help stabilize my fluctuating hearing and improved my overall health considerably. But those parts of my hearing that I needed to make music again were not fixed. Slide. I held a variety of part-time jobs. I sold washing machines. I acted in films and local theater. I appeared in some commercials. Slide. I recorded radio essays about my experiences with food and nutrition. I wrote, directed, and appeared in educational training videos and I started a nonprofit to support small farmers. Slide. Despite the work and the income, it never felt good enough or satisfying enough unless it could bring me back to music. Slide. In 2014, I launched a Kickstarter campaign to support some new tricks to try to rebuild my musical self that everything I had tried previously did not do. Slide. The latest digital hearing aid with music settings microphones and apps. I studied focused listening training with Jeff Plant in Boston, slide. I restarted vocal coaching and I purchased specialized ear monitors to use in the studio if and when I ever got back into the studio, slide. I began writing articles for Phonax Hearing Like Me blog about my experiences with hearing loss and my challenges trying to make music again and wrote several articles about other artists having the same issue. 
and I joined the Association of Adult Musicians with Hearing Loss and found my first real community of colleagues. Slide. Between in 2014 and 15, my story became of interest to others. Now this is 40 years, almost 40 years after it happened. Latin America's largest publisher featured my story 40 years after my success in Brazil in their VIP magazine slide. Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks' wife, launched Voices of Strength in Huffington Post to celebrate people who overcame adversity. My story was selected and published, one of five out of 500 that had been submitted. Slide. Between 2014 and 2017, I worked every tool, toy, and angle to get back to music. But by 2017, my story and my life were about to become ever more interesting. We're gonna hold off on questions and comments. And that's right, I'm gonna introduce you to Laurel Jonasson. Laurie and I wrote a screenplay called Good Enough. It's a love story based on our true story. And it's about my hearing loss, my music quest, and our coming together. Slide. It's about disability, broken dreams, heartache, loss, and redemption. Two aging souls no longer expect anything in life to be perfect. Slide. They set out to find whatever, wherever, and whomever might be good enough and discover each other. We've had the screenplay out and we are looking for filmmakers and producers and directors to turn our screenplay into a film, possibly a musical, possibly a Netflix series. Netflix series. It has a lot of humor and it has my original music slide. We will do a reading from the screenplay. You should know or you may know that the average screenplay is about 110 to 120 pages long, as is ours, and containing between 40 and 60 scenes. We will do a few scenes in the reading from our screenplay, and we will play ourselves and just a few secondary characters to tell a story. Scenes are shortened composites of actual scenes with the dialogue very close to verbatim. Slide. When we say scene, Laurie and I are just switching the settings. And a video of she and I performing the primary musical theme will be played at the end of the reading. Slide. Two thoughts to keep in mind. How do you look at your hearing loss today? Is it good enough for you to do what you want and need to do? Slide. Is your life good enough in other ways? that make your hearing loss a secondary concern or challenge? I think about these questions all the time. And in a minute, I will introduce you to Laurie. And we're gonna set the stage, be right with you. So it's good. Oh, I need to move a little bit this way. Okay. Yes. There have been several performances on Broadway that were just readings. Two actors sit next to each other, each with their own little lights, and narrate a story. That's what Lori and I are going to do. This is Lori Jonasson, the woman of my dreams. And action. By 2017, after several years on my musical quest, I was done. And I didn't believe that I would see 2018. I wasn't sick and I wasn't suicidal. I was tired. You know, 40 years struggling to hear. 40 years without the music I love to play and sing. I was approaching 70 and more alone and isolated than I had ever been. And at my age, you can die from that. In 2017, I was still reeling from a humiliating divorce the year before that nearly destroyed me, my children, and my grandchildren. I was convinced my life was over. There was very little holding me up 
No retirement, no pension. Family and friends were scattered. The only thing keeping me alive was that dream to make music again. I had been married for 48 years and I was newly retired. My husband and I had just purchased an RV to travel the country. On the very day we took ownership, I received the phone call that shattered my marriage and ended my dream. I'd given up much of what constituted a normal life. I had no children. I sold my car. I moved into a small apartment. Years before, I gave up the only possession I ever really cared about, a Steinway baby grand piano. I wasn't sure I was ready for what was next, but I knew it wasn't dating, not right away. It had been 50 years since I last went on a date. I was also approaching 70. That perky 18 year old had long ago left the building. I didn't know how to act, what to say, or who would even go out with me at this point in my life. And even if I wanted a chance at love again, I didn't believe that I had enough material to share with someone. So I didn't try very hard. I filled up my life with the same outdoor activities I had enjoyed with my family, hiking, biking, camping and kayaking. And I joined an acapella women's chorus. I had what I needed materially, but it wasn't enough. I was achingly lonely. Scene. I was very eager and more confident than I should have been to perform live again. With the latest hearing tech and a few sessions of hearing rehab under my belt, I thought I was ready and booked two performances at a friend's coffee house to show off my progress. They were unmitigated disasters. If you can imagine, over the course of two nights and four hours, I dazzled them with my piano playing and sang my heart out and hardly noticed that I was singing off key the entire time to almost a full note sharp. A choral friend of mine, Mitch, tipped me off after the second performance. I was crushed. I hurried to meet with my vocal coach, Betsy, for some much needed encouragement, but that's not what she gave me. Scene. How did your latest gig go, Stu? About as badly as the first one, Betsy though I killed them with my stories. There was an even bigger audience that really, really, really liked my piano playing and my guts. Pitch issues again, huh? Yeah, but I think I know what happened. I need to start right with the, the right program on my hearing aid and I need to line myself up in just such a way that I can- Stu, can I be honest with you? You've been working a long time with the tech and the keyboard and your hearing training and with me, and you're still struggling. I love your music. You're a great writer and a wonderful piano player. That's what others say too. Everyone in fact, but- Your singing. Have you thought about letting other arts do your material? Sure, other artists have done my material long ago, but I'm not connected that way anymore. I wanna sing my own songs, Betsy. I know. But if you can't make pitch, who's going to listen to you? More concerts with people being nice, pats on the back. Is that going to do it for you? You're too good to endure that. I'm not quitting, Betsy. Don't quit. But think about adapting and changing some things. How about speaking your lyrics instead of singing them? Lots of hit songs have been done that way. I'm a singer, Betsy. I'm not doing all this to talk my way through my songs. That's not good enough. Not yet. Scene. My outdoor activities continued to build my confidence. My sister and friends encouraged me to try the online dating scene. I was a dating virgin and I was afraid I might not be good enough for any man. She needn't have worried. After sending out more than 124 emails to potential suitors she met online, it began raining men. Oh, she had a few dates. Uh, yeah, lots and lots of them. In-person dates, phone dates, email dates, 
indoor and outdoor dates, but I was especially intrigued by this one man I had met online, this musician who lived 60 miles away. His profile touched and fascinated me, but I figured he was out of my league. So when I contacted him, I wasn't surprised by his response. Sorry, the stars aren't aligned yet, perhaps sometime soon. Lori's original contact only triggered my well-honed avoidance behavior. I was immune to anything that might take me the way from my musical journey and would demand more of me than I thought I could provide. Mind you, the grass was not growing long under my feet. So I put Stu on my back burner and continued my own quest. I had so many interesting, bad, good, sad and funny dating experiences, and some with men who are just nice guys, but not a match. I kept a journal with each date getting his own nickname. For example, I made a date with a guy I called the coal cut kayak fisherman, and we agreed to go kayaking. We confirmed when he called me the night before. Hi, Lori, it's Rob, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Are we still on for the kayak trip? Oh, you bet. I have the kayaks and the equipment. Let's meet at the boat launch at the lake on Saturday around 11. I'll bring a bottle of wine and why don't you bring a picnic lunch? Sounds good. Any food allergies? No, no food allergies, but I have a couple of preferences. Do you have a pencil and paper? Um, yes. Okay. I would like you to get some Krakus Polish ham, boar's head German bologna, Boar's head turkey breast, not smoked, Hellman's mayo, Cedar's hummus, Pepperidge Farms whole wheat bread, deli rye, Goulden's spicy brown mustard, oh yeah, and some real deli dill pickles. And for dessert, why don't you get some organic fruit and some Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies? Uh, is that all? Uh, I think so. Why don't you put this in a text for me? Okay, I will. When we arrived at the lake picnic area, I wanted to impress. So I set the picnic table with checkered tablecloth, cloth napkins, silverware, and wine glasses. Tupperware containers were neatly arranged with every food Rob requested. It was a feast for a king or a meal for a family of 12. Rob arrived early 70s, dressed L.L. Bean casual, fisherman's hat and vest sprinkled with colorful fishing lures. We sat and ate and, and got to know each other. But after lunch, I cleaned up alone, packing all the leftovers into the very large cooler that I had brought and emptied the garbage while he waited impatiently, if you can believe it, at the boat launch. We got into our kayaks and pushed off. And after a short distance, we paddled to a cove. Rob pulled a fishing pole from under his seat, selected a lure that he attached to the end of the line and cast the line into the lake. Do you mind if I fish for a while? Um, okay. All right, but we need to be quiet and still so we don't scare the fish. So no talking or moving around. Now, I'm sorry I didn't bring you, Paul. Why don't you just relax? For the next hour, we exchanged no verbal communication. As one who was used to being very active, I nevertheless tried to relax, catch some sun, squirmed in the kayak, and looked at my watch. I signaled Rob and began to paddle toward him, but he gestured me away. So I pulled out my phone from my dry bag and logged on to the match site and scrolled around to find Mr. Next. Finally fed up, I paddled to the launch site, stepped out of the kayak, left it on the ramp, walked to my car and sped off. Rob was totally oblivious. Scene. I called in my friend Mitch for a powwow, convinced that I was making progress, even if my vocal coach couldn't hear it. He was pleased at my singing and my was getting stronger and more precise, 
but he sniffed out my loneliness and suggested that I find a lady friend online to have more of a life. Lacking any other remedy for my darkness, I logged on to my usual dating site. I wasn't looking for love, just someone who could tolerate my hearing loss in my dream long enough to fill some of the loneliness that I felt. At that moment, even though I didn't feel I had much to offer, I still had my standards. She had to be five feet three or taller, at least someone who could reach the minimum height bar at an amusement park, have silver or brunette hair, no phony blondes apply. And most importantly, she must live within five miles of where I lived. Well, not to be surprised, pickings were very slim. And with the occasional coffee date, I remained in my cave. Scene. After a few weeks, I sent Stu another email. Are the stars aligned yet? To my surprise, he said yes, and we began an email correspondence. I had to admit that O'Lori did not meet my exacting standards. She was, in fact, five feet two, had blonde hair, and lived 60 miles away. I was intrigued enough. She was very attractive, accomplished, friendly, and most of all, she wanted to meet me. We were often chatting because of my hearing by text and email only. As I had discovered, very few men let on about their flaws or ailments, but Stu was very clever about his hearing loss. He sent me an article that appeared in the Huffington Post that mentioned it, but also highlighted his earlier musical successes and his journey to get back to music. As we continued our emails, even before we actually dated, I knew he could be the guy for me. And I felt that the more we communicated, Lori might just be the answer to my loneliness. Speaking of which, I received a call from a local HLAA chapter in, in an invitation to speak about my favorite subjects, loneliness and isolation, which I figured the audience I spoke to would know a lot about. <clears throat> I wanna thank you for inviting me here tonight I've been writing and speaking about hearing loss for some time, and I thought I'd like to address some personal issues from my own experience, things that we know a lot about, loneliness and isolation. My bilateral hearing loss started the same year that this organization was founded, more than 40 years ago, which gives me a unique perspective of some kind. I wish I knew more about the HLAA all those years ago and even more importantly, all those years since. But the truth is that I didn't make contact with the people or the services that I could access through HLA for many years. My bad. All those years, I stayed in my original lane with the people that I knew, none of whom had hearing loss. It meant that I tried to live the life of a person with good hearing and suffered all the pitfalls that that could bring. And you all know what it means to be faking it. I did for decades. It meant that as more time went on, I was more lonely and isolated than I had ever been and unwilling to reach out for help in any real sense. I kept saying no to life, even though I thought that my music would give me everything that I needed. I'm not so sure that it can. Scene, I was excited to tell my sister and my friends that I had met this fascinating man online who lost his hearing years ago and has sight in just one eye. They were incredulous, one of them saying, tell me if I get this straight, you're, you're thinking about dating a man who cannot hear you or see you? Look, I said, I've been out with men who have two ears and two eyes who can't communicate. It's what, what's between the ears that counts, isn't it? The ladies were not convinced, but I was not to be denied. I was moving forward with my music, spending hours each day ripping it up on the piano and singing at the top of my lungs, pitch be damned. But I was starting to feel the music again and becoming confident. I was becoming too and hitting my notes. For a pleasant change, my vocal coach started to notice 
And we worked on a technique that I had used during my recording days that allowed me to find pitch and hold it. I would play the melody to a song I was singing in the right hand and use that as a guide for my singing. It worked and I still use it to this day. I felt good enough, in fact, that I decided it was time to meet Lori face to face. So we agreed to meet for lunch. Seeing our first date at a cozy seaside sandwich shop was all I needed to know that Stu might be the man I'd been looking for. Our playful banner, banter, focused attention to each other and genuine affection touched us both. I choreographed the seating arrangements to accommodate my vision and, and hearing, and we discovered that we had much in common. Then she let me have it. I'm so glad the stars have aligned enough for you to consent to meet me. Well, you look like a nice kid. I thought I'd give you a break. What made you agree to meet with me? I was desperate. Oh, waiter, check please. Okay, tell me about your blonde hair and tell me that it's yours. I suppose I should be insulted, but I'm not. All mine. I was actually, and still am a redhead. My hair didn't turn gray, it began to turn blonde in my 30s and 40s. You were hoping for a brunette? Just an old habit. Your hair is beautiful. We spent the next two hours sitting close, talking intimately, loudly laughing saying insightful and silly things and being ever so charming to each other. Then I asked Stu to tell me about his hearing loss. Hmm, okay, follow me if you can. Okay. Again, line, follow me if you can. I hear with my right ear with a hearing aid. I have no hearing in my left ear and I have tinnitus in both ears and no sight in my right eye. My match, game, match name should have been Magoo, but I didn't want to give myself away so early in the game. So if you continually shift position as we speak, I'll be able to both hear you and see you sometimes simultaneously, perhaps. Let me illustrate what happened to me so you have an idea of what I am dealing with and trying to do. Let's say that these are the hair cells in a good cochlea. There are about 15,000 of them that transmit sound. These are the hair cells I had left after the Titanic hit the iceberg. And now I try to hear with what I have left. So I'm missing things. How does this impact music? All hell breaks loose. And trying to sing in key is a sometimes chancy, dicey and iffy thing. You mentioned that pitch is an issue for you. I sing in an a cappella chorus and pitch is what we work on all the time. Maybe I can help you with your pitch. That's, that's a nice idea. Lori, you don't think I'm crazy to be pursuing a dream that I lost years ago with my challenges at my age, do you? Crazy? No, you're not crazy. Stu, I'm almost 70 and recently divorced in the most painful of ways. I had and still have a dream to travel. Life is short, so what are we waiting for? Here we are, sharing some precious minutes as the clock ticks. What's non-negotiable for you? What will you no longer live without? I want a real partner I can talk to and share everything with, who will engage me and challenge me, someone I can go to bed with and wake up with every morning. And who wants these things too? Old fashioned, perhaps. But how many years do we have left? That sounds a lot like my list too. I've been alone a lot in my life and thought I could fill in the spaces with music, but I can't with music alone. I don't have much to give in return. I don't think your gifts would be limited at all. Lori, I have to get my rental car back. Stu, I'd like to see you again. Long distance is a problem and, and the height thing. Perhaps we can find accommodations. I hope so. Anyways, I'm going to a party on the beach with some friends on Christmas Eve. 
and I'd like you to join me. I was my usual non-committal self and told Lori that I would think about it and get back to her. I gave her a CD of my music, a very chaste kiss, and we said goodbye. Scene. I could hardly wait to share my feelings for Stu with my sister and friends. To me, he was wonderful. Present, beautiful, brave, witty, and transparent. I loved his music and just knew we were seeking the same things. My friends were protective and skeptical and wondered how I gleaned all of this from a first date. They feared I was just becoming a groupie. I said I didn't care and I felt we were meant to be together, even if Stu didn't know it yet. My sister was also worried that my starving artist friend might not have enough to share a life together, but nothing anyone said could shake my confidence. We were meant to be together. I was unsettled and felt that Lori was out of my league. So I called my friend Mitch in to talk about the woman and my ambivalent feelings. I said, Mitch, I like this woman a whole lot. Damn if she isn't on the case. Sharp, attentive, lots of integrity, and very adorable. Mitch said, so what's the problem? I said, I don't do adorable anymore, remember? I like taller women who are vague, distant, and hard to reach. Women I write songs about, women I could say no to. This one is right out front about everything. Scary. Scene. For the next several weeks, we carried on an intense written exchange that was parts funny, provocative, affectionate, flirty, and demonstrated two things clearly, how much I wanted to connect with Stu and how hard he worked to stay detached. Okay, I admit it. Lori's deficiencies were just excuses I made up to avoid a more serious relationship that would demand more from me than I felt I could provide. Finally, at my prodding, we agreed to be just friends and that she should continue dating. That didn't sit well. I'll say, in a text, in a text, mind you, Stu actually encouraged me to continue to peruse the manscape while he explored the hearts and souls of other women. I was furious and decided to show him that two could play that game. So I sent him a lengthy list of attractive new suitors complete with screenshots of their pictures, men who were eager for my time and affection. It did the trick. I'll say. She had my full attention, and now I was afraid I was going to lose her. I admitted to Mitch that despite every excuse not to, I was falling in love with Lori. By the time Christmas Eve arrived, I could no longer ignore that my feelings had grown deeper and that I was openly smitten. That Christmas Eve, the fate smiled on us, and our date was magical. We walked in the sand on a snowy beach, holding hands, sharing gazes, and light kisses. Then we join the indoor festivities. A woman sitting across the room from us noticed the two of us sitting hand-locked on a couch, smiling like two teens mid-crush, and asked us how long we'd been married. <laughs> I laughed and told her it was, in fact, just our second date. We snuck out early from the party and headed off to share a quiet dinner together at the only restaurant on the beach open on Christmas Eve. The restaurant was empty and we were seated in a quiet corner window booth. Twinkling Christmas lights and candles lent a perfect romantic atmosphere. I could not take my eyes off of Lori. Reached across the table and grabbed both her hands, kissing them softly. I had a lot to say. I've been putting you off for some time, Lori, and I'm sorry about that. I've been afraid of many things, but I was very excited about seeing you today, and I really enjoyed our time together. I'm glad you said yes. This feels like more than a date, and my gut never lies. What's it telling you? To listen. With hearing loss, we often talk much more than we listen, and I want to hear what you have to say. It's nice to be talking instead of reading texts. 
We ordered our food and I let Lori lead the conversation over dinner until she was finished. Okay, your turn. Lori, you're magnificent and I am truly besotted. I love your spirit, your sense of humor, your feistiness, your independence, your real blonde hair. Even though you're too short and you live outside my acceptable mileage parameters. Well, Magoo, if you can overlook my shortcomings, I can try and overlook yours. Okay, I have a few deficiencies, but most of all, I don't have enough things to share with you. I had this conversation with my sister recently. She married a guy who didn't have much, so she knows the routine. They have what they need together, no matter where it comes from. And it's not a big deal. I don't want to lose you. Years ago, I made choices that didn't give me a lot of security for myself, much less for two. Stu, most of the guys I dated already had lots of stuff, money, houses, kids, mega hobbies, and it felt like they were pretty set in their ways and would expect me to fit into their, into their lives. I don't need you to take care of me. Maybe I could take care of us. I don't know if I could do that or let you do that or feel comfortable if I did. What can I bring to you in return? Oh, you can bring me those things that money can't buy. Remember, affection, attention, touching, lots of laughter. I remember. And going to bed together every night. And waking up together every morning. That too. I agreed to be just friends at your request. But all along, I wanted more. And now I live in a big, lonely house. I do all kinds of things with my friends, but I'm still alone. So am I. Oh, Stu, come and share my life with me. I will never know why I held out my life that way, this way, at this time to him. But I never doubted that if I ever made this offer to anyone, he was the man. I've been saying no to life and love for a long time. But right now, every part of me is screaming to jump back into life with you. And you're telling me that whatever I am and can bring to us is enough. I don't know how I can say yes, but only a fool would say no. We finished our meal, got up to go, walked out of the restaurant arm in arm stopping for our first real passionate kiss. You want to read that line again? <laughs> we finished our meal, got up to go, walked out of the restaurant arm in arm, stopping for our first real passionate kiss. Now you got it. For once, my affections were stronger than my pride and I agreed to her offer and to share whatever I could bring to our life together. We went back to we spent an idyllic Christmas Eve night at my apartment. We drank a lot of wine, exchanged a lot of kisses, and I played the piano. We spent the night together and woke up in each other's arms. The next morning, I told him that's how I wanted to wake up every morning from now on. I was warm, but struggled with my feelings and cannot shake the fear that I, was not, I did not have enough and I wasn't good enough for her. At breakfast, Stu was quiet and distant, but I invited him to spend New Year's Eve with me. Once again, I was non-committal about anything further at that moment. I only wanted some confirmation that we would see each other again. I didn't get it. Badly shaken, I left him quickly and hopped in my car to drive upstate New York to spend Christmas with my son's family. I assumed that Stu and I were done. Scene. I was having a very difficult time knowing how strongly I have felt for Lori, but still not sure what I could offer her. But by the next day, my feelings were very clear, and I was sure that Lori was going to be my future as well. I reached out to her with emails, texts, and even called several times to no avail. She was not responding, and I couldn't blame her. Soon after I arrived at my son's house, my cell phone disappeared. Six days later, as I was about to leave for home, my granddaughter saved the day when she found my cell phone hidden under the dog's 
bed. As I headed down the turnpike, and to my utter shock, my phone started retrieving several messages from Stu. I thought, oh no, he must have given up on me. I stepped on the gas and never let up the rest of the way home. When I arrived, Stu was there waiting to greet me at my front door. I was shocked to see him, sure I had lost him for good. Stu, what, how, where did you come from? What happened? I never heard from you. I sent emails, texts, even a sexy phone message. Nothing, you never answered. Oh, Stu, I know, Andy's dog ate my phone. What is that? His dog ate my phone. I didn't see your messages until a few hours ago. I'm so sorry. I thought we were done. I thought I lost you on Christmas morning. Laura, you didn't lose me. I was just trying to figure out how to say yes. We embraced for a long time and I took Stu into the house. When I turned the lights on, he saw it immediately. A 100 year old Steinway baby grand piano. It was my grandmother's. I inherited it 10 years ago. I've been waiting for someone to play it for me. I gazed at that beautiful thing like a hungry man seeing his first meal in a long time and sat down to play. I began by speaking the lyrics to one of my songs that was on the CD I had given to Lori, playing the melody in my right hand as a guide and started to sing in what I believed was perfect pitch. To my pleasant surprise, Lori joined me in the second verse and we finished together. And after we finished, I had to know. So I asked her, how was that? I smiled at Stu with all the love I felt for him and said simply, that was that it was good enough. Scene, curtain. Stu and I have been together since in, that New Year's Eve, 2017. In July of 2018, I recorded my first studio recording in more than 40 years. And on Christmas Eve, 2019, two years after our second date, we were engaged. Here's a video of the song that we sang together at the end of the screenplay that we recorded early in the pandemic lockdown. It's called Forever Yours. And Amanda, it's yours. Like most of us, Lori and I understand well the challenges of being together all the time. And we also know the only way to make it through is this. Be good to me. The days have taken all they could of me. The simple things that you can do for me a patient heart some tea and sympathy be kind to me holding hands and kisses just fine with me show me there'll always be some time for me and i will know that you and i
Great job. Um, we have about four minutes. We can open it up for a quick Q&A if there's a question or two. Um, there aren't any questions yet. So if anyone wants to type a quick question or two in the, um, in the Q&A box, um, they can answer it at this time. Give it a few seconds. Um, if we don't have any questions, then if there's anything you, Stu or Lori, would like to say to end. Thank you for having us. People are saying bravo. Um, yes, this will be um, available on our website. Congratulations to you both. People are mostly just sending their well wishes <laughs> and saying <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, I guess we have three minutes, so there might not be even be time for a question. So um, I just want to thank you, Stu and Lori, so much for your amazing performance. Um, and thank you, Lisa Johnson, for your really great CART services today. Uh, like I said, this webinar um, will be posted to the HLA website um, at hearingloss.org. You can check hearingloss.org for future webinars uh, and, uh, and past webinar recordings. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Please stay safe and I hope you really have a great rest of your day. Bye bye everyone. Thank you.